hope you, you can see my screen. So this, this section is about uh, one particular uh, feature of Pulsar, which is the exclusive producer. So this is a new feature that was introduced in Pulsar 2.8. And uh, I want to show like how you can use uh, Pulsar to build distributed application. So Pulsar is a distributed system itself, but you can use it as well to build uh, your own distributed uh, application. And I will show how this new feature makes it easier for applications to build on top of Pulsar. Um, just a few lines about myself. Uh, I'm Matteo Merli. I'm the CTO at the Extreme Native. I'm also the co-creator and the PMC chair for Apache Pulsar. And uh, I'm the, also the PMC member of Bookkeeper. And I've been working at uh, previously at Splunk, Streamio, and Yahoo, where, where uh, at Yahoo I, I was, uh, yeah, we've been creating Pulsar. Uh, a few years ago now. So the agenda for this talk is uh, I want to just go through some of the common patterns that uh, we've been seeing. Uh, some of them, not all of them. These are not, not a, a, any exhaustive list here, but common patterns for like uh, that people use when when building the, the distributed applications. And I, I just want to show that. It's, uh, it's not easy as it seems. Uh, there are like, many tricky uh, aspects of, of these patterns and, and in general, like in the, uh, how to, to design and uh, implement uh, distributed applications. And with that, like uh, the, the concept of fencing and, uh, and then I will show like uh, first, like how process solves this, this problem. And uh, I will also go through a bit on how this feature works internally. So how can we provide these kind of guarantees? So what are common patterns in these applications? I think there are a few of them that most people are familiar with, right? And uh, the first one is distributed locks. Uh, distributed locks essentially are a way to re re replicate on a distributed scale the same concept that people are used to uh, to do on a on a single node uh, systems. Um, like if you if you have a mutex on on your uh, on your process, then basically you can take the mutex, modify some resource, read, and you are assured that no one is going to touch this resource, and then you can release the mutex when you're done. Um, so mute, the distributed locks works in a similar way, but there are kind of like uh, some uh, additional uh, aspect of it. So. Um, first of all, a process can crash, and uh, we have to make sure that these locks is automatically released in case of failure. But in the same way that you, you use these distributed locks to protect, uh, uh, so if, when you want to have ex exclusive access to some shared resource. So you, in this case, you don't have just a mutex uh, class, you have a lock service. So the client will use some client library, we connect to, to, to the lock service, and it will ask to acquire locks on resource one. And block service, we say, okay, this is free. Um, I'm going to. Oops, sorry. Okay, I had some something. I uh, was not. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, um, the lock service will will say, okay, this is uh, you are now the the. The owner of this lock. Um, if 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 another client tried to acquire a lock on the same resource one, we get an error. So uh, if we figure out that that does not own, own it, the in case client one crashes now, uh, what happens is that the lock on this resource has to be released automatically because the client uh, the client does not uh, interact with the lock service anymore. So the lock service has, has to act on it and has to remove the lock and release it. Um, so now if client two comes back and tries to acquire it again, now it will succeed. And and uh, so example of this is again, like the shared resources. So you can pr protect completely modi modifications to some say, database record, or you can use it for like ownership or assignment. Um, you can write like say which node is uh, is owning this uh, particular resource. And and finally, you can use that for service discovery. So you can have uh, this kind of like locks and then the lock inside will, will contain the, the information of, of the node. So you know like, who is the owner of this resource and then you can connect directly to that uh, node. 
Uh, another one which is very pop popular is lead direction. And uh, lead direction is kind of like similar. Typically, it's implemented in a slightly similar way to the lock, this bit of locks, but the, the, the intention here is, a, is more nuanced. Um, the, the, the main appeal of lead direction is that you want to basically you have a problem of coordination. You have multiple nodes that are trying to do different things, and you want to re reduce this problem to be uh, a single node problem, a, a local problem. And the way you, you, you do that is that you are, say that among these nodes, among these peers, uh, I want them to figure out to elect one leader, and that leader will basically make the, the decision on, on its own, and uh, it, and it, it does not have to, to talk with them. And anyone else, you can just make lo local decision and then communicate these local local de decisions to everyone, so that the decision process becomes much more simple because it's, it's, it is just like like a, a local piece of code. Um, so this leader can perform different kind of tasks. So make it like you want to have like, say one task has to be performed only by one node, and you don't care which particular which node. So you just act one leader, and the leader will take tasks. In some other cases, it would be decision. So it would then need to use some other uh, mechanism to communicate this decision to the followers. Um, one such, such example, we have the traffic load, load manager in Pulsar that elects one leader to uh, perform some um, uh, assignments of the of, of groups of topics to, to brokers. That's, that is done to, uh, to make it um, easier and, uh, and to avoid having these uh, lagging feedback loop that might incur into uh, assigning traffic uh, based on on a stale view of the current traffic. So the way that typically the lead election works is that you have multiple clients and uh, each client is trying to become a leader. So they can connect to, to this leader election service and everyone tries to become the leader. The leader election service will pick, will keep, will pick one and um, and we tell them that it, this is the leader. So once you get the disk of confirmation, you can start performing your leader tasks or or, or like making making the, the, the decision. If client one has a failure, then the leadership will get released. Uh, the leader action service will figure out that this client is partitioned. This client has been it has crashed, so it will revoke that leadership and will uh, now pick up a new one, uh, a new client, and then will. Uh, notify this client that uh, now, for, from now on, you, you, you are the leader. Uh, so yeah, it's just, there are similarities with the, this with the locks, but the, the intention is a bit different, right? So in the lock, you want to fail early if you try to acquire it and you don't succeed. In this case, typically you want to wait until uh, you're becoming the leader. So, so that, that you don't have to keep pulling, keep retrying. Instead, uh, you try and if you're not, if there is already a leader, you want to wait until this leader crashes, and in which case you get you, you will get not, not notified that that you now are the leader. Um, typical, typical options to implement this kind of uh, this with the local leader elections are like Zookeeper and ItCD. Uh, so these are like very mature coordination services. They have exactly different semantics, but they're very similar cap cap capabilities. So you can implement the same stuff in a slightly different ways. And uh, they're both very mature. They have been using for um, 10 years uh, uh, in case of Zookeeper and a few, few years less than in case of ITCD, but they're, uh, they're, very, they're, they're very good options. So the way that, that you, 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 you would implement this with the locks, like, so if you look at Zookeeper, Basically, you to keep has a concept of these ephemeral nodes. Um, you try to create this ephemeral node, which will get released automatically if you if you crash. And if that Z node already exists, then you say that the lock is already taken. Otherwise, we are we if we successfully created the, the Z node, then we are the owner. So uh, so if we lose a session with Zookeeper, then this node will go away and get uh, automatically cleaned up. Um, it, it's the, it's similar, so you, you, you can create keys with the TTL so that uh, if the client does not refresh that, that key, it will get expired. So it's similar. It's, the only difference here is that in Zookeeper, it, there is a, a single session that the client 
that the client will keep with the with the Scuba service. So when that session goes away, everything be belonging to that session expires. Uh, with ETCD is a key by key base. So you can have key, some keys expiring, some keys that are not, not expiring. So you, you might have a bit of more uh, thing happening in different times. Um, leader election. So leader election is, uh, uh, in Zuckerberg, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of similar, but Zuckerberg has a concept of a sequential ephemeral Z node. Essentially like Zuckerberg, can guarantee you that that it will prepend the unique version number to to to, to zero and eight. So, if you mark this node to be created as a sequential, it will basically prepend this uh, version number. So now you, now you have unique names, and the, the typical way that that you will do that is that a client will get the list. You get the list of the z nodes under under a path. You sort them, and then the one that has the lowest version number is chosen as the leader. So. This is like one way of doing leader action in Zookeeper. There are a few others with different trade-offs, but this kind of, kind of, kind of like the, the, the main recipe for doing leader, leader action on Zookeeper. And then you, you said you, had, you, you have a watch on the directory so that you, you get notified when that, 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 that leader node is gone. And then you, you go back and do, and you, um, do this, the same thing again. Um, in uh, and etcd is very similar to locks so you use keys with ttl and uh, and again uh you try to to acquire that and if it doesn't work then you have to wait and so on uh, i was mentioning that so th this is a tricky business uh and the reason is that the things are not as easy as they seem so uh we talk about this leader election do you like the leader the leader will do some tasks and uh, it's it's on its own. Uh, same thing with, with locks, right? Um, and this, this is not a problem of ETCD or, or Zookeeper. They work very well as they advertise. Um, but the question is that um, there are fine prints in the in the, in the semantics of the steel set that, that are like very often over, overlooked, and they're like a very difficult question that that, that, you, that you have to answer. Uh, so, for example, like how can you be hundred percent sure that um, you do, we don't have like two clients that think to be the leader at the same time? And uh, what about like what, if I acquire the ownership of some resource? Um, how can we make sure that? Interactions with other systems, like I'm, I'm writing to a dat database or or or, or on, a, on, a, on a shared disks, are are also like uh, severe. So that, that that if I lose the ownership of some resource, how can that be prevented from writing on that file? For example, uh, there are timing problems with that, right? From from the moment that the this uh, session gets expired, the, the ownership expires from the, uh, and while I was doing some operation on, on the shared resources. So typically like you cannot avoid having uh, two different uh, clients being uh, thinking that they, they are the owner of that resource at the, at the, at the same time, uh, even though things will, will clear up. So if you look at the concurrent owner, right? Um, for example, like you have um, client one acquires a resource, uh, a lock on resource one, it gets okay. And at some point, there is a network partition. So now, uh, the network partition will, will last for a while. The lock service, after some point that is not able to, to hear from client one, it will release automatically the, the lock on, on resource one. Uh, once resource one is released, then another client will be able to, to acquire the lock again. At this point, you have the uh, the both client one and client two thinking that, that they are the owner of that, that resource. And uh, the client one might detect the failure, uh, uh, but, uh, but there is no guarantee on the timing of, of that. So if it, if it detects the failure after the lock service has already released the lock, uh, then you have this split, split, split bin scenario. And based on, on the timing and the clocks that are, that, that are different in the different nodes, there is no way that, that, that we can uh, avoid this kind of scenario. Uh, we, we can work around it and, and, and I, I will show how. Um, the other thing is that we are interacting with other systems as well. So even though we are like, detecting this, um, the interaction with, uh, 
even though we detect that we we lost that, we might have uh, operations that, that are uh, pending and that will corrupt the data. So one such, such, such example is like, a, uh, we have these uh, distributed lock that is uh, protecting a NFS file system. So both nodes are like writing on, the, on that uh, NFS mount and client one had the lock on it. And now there is a net, network partition. But before then this network partition is detected, the, the network partition here was with lock service um, and not necessarily with, with, with NFS. So the client one will initiate a write on the, on, on a file on the on the on the on the, on the NFS mount. At the same time, the lock service will detect network partitions will release a lock. Client two will get the lock and will write in some file. So now, now you can get data corruption there. So this begs the question for uh, how can we prevent? And the, the, the answer there is to use the mechanism that is called fencing. Basically, fencing means that you want to revalidate at the storage level, or like when you're writing somewhere. Uh, the, with the external system, system that, that you are interacting with, uh, you want to uh, make sure that, that you can uh, fence out the, the system that is not the owner anymore. And there are different ways of doing that depending on, on the system. But the fencing typically works that um, the, this ownership is revalidated. So if you are writing, if client one is writing to the database and C2 starts writing to database as well on the same say, table or record, uh, the DB will have database will have to be able to reject any pending write from C1, and uh, you can do that by um, using epoch numbers, and then you are able to discard them. Or you can use transactions on the database, and so it, 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 all these kind of operations that that, that 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 you can make sure that after C2 starts writing, you want to make sure that every, everything else that was pending for C1 is discarded and rejected. Uh, one such, such example is Bookkeeper. So Bookkeeper has a concept of fencing. Uh, so, and this, this fencing is done by, uh, to ensure the consistency of the data, of course. And, um, and basically like the fencing always happens before attempt to read the, the data. The point here is that uh, once you start reading from a Bookkeeper ledger, you don't want to have any more data to be added to that ledger again, so that, that you can establish you, you open that, uh, that, 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 that ledger, you, you have to seal it and establish that this is the last entry in, in the ledger and nothing else more is uh, accepted on, on the ledger. So the way it works is deeply that your client with, with, with one ledger will write some entries, say it's like 10, what, zero, then uh, it gets written to multiple bookies, then 10, one gets written to multiple bookies. And then uh, another client is opening this ledger 10 for recovery. So that means that the ledger is fenced. So the client will, issue fence request before starting to read, it will issue fence request to, um, to, to the bookies, to the storage nodes. And then we start the recovery process. And, but once the fence has been, uh, uh, is in effect, essentially like the bookies will re reject any new rights. So at, at this point, the ledger is fenced, no more data is allowed after that. So at this point, we can start the recovery process that will uh, establish what was the last entry. And we are sure that, that there will be no more entries after that because the, the, the bookies will have that fence bit uh, enabled. So the fencing is a very powerful property. And uh, essentially, like it gives you the guarantee that there is only one single writer on, on the resource. Uh, and um, like in this case, like you, you, you don't you don't do need to do do to do like this. Uh, um, so, bookkeeper has this fencing property, um, and um, the, one of the ideas is, is that how how can we expose this fencing property to also personal users? Because the idea here is that bookkeeper is does doesn't do like leader actions on the distributed logs. It just do, does this fencing on the ledgers. And the Bookkeeper API is fairly low level. So it's it's a kind of like a storage API. And um, and we want to have like a, a, a more high high level API for for, for users here. Uh, so the idea that when we started this was to how can we uh, leverage what we do have in Bookkeeper and provide that as a feature on, on Pulsar. 
so that's why the exclusive producer had, had, had was was started and the, the idea here is that the goals uh, is that we want to ensure a linear and non interly interleaves history of messages uh do we have like say one producer that will write some 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 data it will be exclusive access and then if when the this will go away there will be another producer but these blocks will be not be interleaved between each other so there'll be a sequence of histories of the different producers all completely separated and the goal here is to have this kind of like a building block to create leader action and distributed locks directly to Pulsar user and, and effectively exposing fencing as a property in Pulsar itself. Uh, the way you uh, uh, enable this in your producer is simply by the, there's a new access mode uh, uh, configuration that was added in the producer builder. So this was added in 2.8 release. Uh, so you, you can request the producer access mode ex exclusive. There, uh, the, the, the default is still shared, so it's, it's still like the, the, the old model, but you can uh, require this exclusive access on your, your producer. Um, there is also a, a, a different uh, uh, flavor of, of it, which is the wait for it exclusive. So essentially like, on the exclusive one, if you try to create it, if there is already a producer on that topic, um, your pr producer will will fail immediately. So you try to create it, it fails. You say there's already there's, there's already a producer, so you cannot create a new, a new one. Any 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 exclusive access. If you say wait for exclusive, basically it is the same, but you, the create will not fail immediately. Instead, it will uh, be blocked there, be pending until you have exclusive access. Um, I, I mentioned the, the linear top history, right? So once the producers are fenced, uh, we don't want to have more data that we accepted from them. So um, if you have a producer that was created, you have producer okay, and now producer two is saying, okay, I'm waiting for exclusive access. So it's pending there. Now, um, Producer uh, one sends a message. That's fine. That's the that's the block of history of producer one. And if there's a net, net network partition, then producer one might get dis disconnected from brokers. At this point, uh, the the broker might detect that okay, producer one is gone. I have to pick up a new one. At this point, uh, the producer one is it is considered fenced, and um, the broker will. Uh, Elect a new producer, say producer two. Now you are, you, you get the okay. Now, now you are, now, now you do have exclusive access. But at the same time, and at the, at the point we start the producer two session. So for the moment that this, this, the broker decide that the producer one is fenced, uh, basically anything that producer one will send will be rejected by the, by, by the brokers. So if, if, if there was like this uh, temporary natural partitions and the producer one comes back and try to send, has some pending data in the queue that, that was being sent to, to, to the broker that will get fe uh, fenced and rejected. And only producer two will be allowed to publish until producer two crashes as well. Um, implementation wise, so the, the, the idea here is, is that we have a new concept, which is a topic epoch. Uh, so the topic epoch is a counter which is stored in the, in the topic meta, metadata, and it is only used if you enable exclusive producers. So it will, it will only get increased with exclusive producers at this point. Uh, and each time a new exclusive producer becomes active, then it will the, the epoch will get incremented. So um, and essentially, the epoch is the one that is used to control uh, the the fenced status of producers. So um, if you're trying to connect and you're use, using an epoch number that, that is below the current epoch, then you will get a fence exception. So because the topic epoch has already moved on and you're 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 belonging to a, to an older epoch that that is that is not allowed anymore. And from a, from an API perspective, once the producer instance is fenced, basically you have to close it. And, uh, and you, you cannot re risk it any, any, anymore. The topic hippo has, has already moved. You cannot like, uh, uh, join back. So you have to close this, this producer and you can create a new, a new one. And then you, you will get again on this uh, 
on this lecture on who is the exclusive uh, access, who, who has the exclusive access to, to the topic. So if you look at the topic epoch, uh, the sequence here is that um, uh, when the producer, uh, producer one uh, gets started, so it, the first time it, it, it doesn't know which epochs it belongs to, so it will come to the topic, say, I, I want to have exclusive access, the topic, the broker will tell, okay, now we are in epoch one, your, your producer is okay, and, and you are in epoch one, uh, and you, know, you can, you can send, send messages. So if, if there is an, a network uh, error and the producer re reconnects, uh, if the epoch has not moved, this producer this producer will be able to uh, keep going, right? Because if he if he goes back and say, I I have epoch equal one, so oh it is still equal to the to the topic epoch. So you are you are just the one that he was uh, owning this. Um, you had exclusive access before, so you can come back on the same epoch. And so that will be getting uh, okay after recognition. But conversely, like if there was a network partitions, and in the same time, while producer one is partitioned, producer two comes in and uh, again says that I, I want to have exclusive access. Now the broker will say, okay, I'm increasing the epoch. Now we have topic epoch equal two, and you are the owner. Um, and if producer one comes back uh, after the network partition reconnects to, to the topic, now it will still say that I'm I have epoch one, and the, and the broker will will say that you. You, you, you are fenced off, and this also like uh, man, means with, with the with the, with the messages as well. So, right? so if the uh, if there were like any pending messages, that will also get um, fenced. So if you, if you're putting everything to, together like this fencing and exclusivity, uh, so what can we build? Uh, essentially, like we can use this. Uh, Exclusive access to build, for example, like a leader election on Pulsar. Uh, you don't need to use Zookeeper or ITCD uh, directly. You can achieve achieve the same result on Pulsar, and I, sh I show you like how it's even even easier. Uh, and the reason here is that uh, you have um, each peer basically it be, be trying to to become this exclusive pro pro producer on a, on, a, on a topic. And who who succeeds in, in being the exclusive, exclusive producer on that topic? It is the leader. And um, to achieve the fencing, what you do is that uh, the leader will make all this on this decision, and it will use the topic to communicate the decision. So I'm taking the decision X that everyone has to follow, and I will write that on the on, on the topic. So and. If something is written on the topic, then it means that the, the, the decision is taken. And this is safe because uh, if I lose the exclusive access, this decision will not go through on the topic. So as long as I can write on the topic, it, it, it doesn't matter if I if we do have a split brain in, in the sense that um, if we have two uh, peers that are thinking that they are the leader, because the broker will disambiguate, it, disambiguate that. So the old one would always get fenced and get rejected. So if I thought that I was a leader, I'm making some decision, I'm writing that on the topic. If that fails, means that I'm not, not a, the leader anymore. So I have to close my, 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 my producer and, and go back in line and try the, the, the same thing again. So, um, but this is essentially how, how you combine. So exclusive access and making all the decision uh, to be effective by Publishing them on the same topic, um, and if you're looking at distributed locks, uh, this is like a very similar uh, to leader election. So you have, um, if you want to get a lock on a resource, you will get, you will open exclusive producer on that topic uh, that rep represents the resource, and um, and you are also like making all the mutation on the resource through messages published on the on the topic. And again, that means that. Uh, if you are, um, uh, if you lose that access, then this operation will not go through. So you, pub you, you publish on the topic and you can consume from the topic. If you see that the result on the topic, then you can apply those. Uh, if that fails, you can keep uh, uh, reapplying th those, those, those mutations, but you will have a, a, a consistent state because the history will be linear and not interleaved. 
And uh, I hope that uh, was like an interesting uh, uh, deep dive and uh, on the get this on the uh, screw producer and gives an, an idea on how you you can use this and uh, and uh, and how you can, you can build your your own di distributed applications on top on top of Pulsar and uh, and uh, how you, you you can combine and have like both the uh, the leader action and locks and the fencing bit which is very important to to easily build a, a consistent and and safe uh, distributed system and I'm be happy, very happy to answer any questions here on the on the chat or you, you can. Uh, also ping me here on Hopin or ping me on Slack or uh, anywhere else.